that your students are willing to draw portraits on an 8 by 10 canvas next Sunday for anyone willing to pledge a donation to help these kids get to camp. Would you be willing to do a quick sketch of me this morning? Oh, we oui, monsieur. next Sunday. Your options are during cafe time from 1015 to 1045 in the Fellowship Center or following next Sunday's morning worship service in the Sanctuary Foyer. If you would like a pledge card, I would like to ask you guys to stand. Who would like a pledge card? Please stand. And the children are going to bring you a pledge card. Don't let these artists starve. Come on. All right. Stay standing. They're going to give you a pledge card. Complete that card and then drop it in the offering plate when the offering goes around later, okay? Stay standing until they get you a card. And fill that out. Donation goes to Kids Camp, the scholarship fund, the Hanula Scholarship Fund, and we will be blessed to have your help. Next Sunday, they'll be drawing portraits of you. We gotta get somebody over here, guys. Over here, we got some over here. Christian, hit them up. Everybody got one? Okay. Thank you, Monsieur Pierre, for reminding us of the wonderful opportunity to invest in the spiritual wellness of our kids. Let's give her a hand, Jimmy. children. We're excited about you going to kids camp. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're now here in the presence of the Lord. And someone has said the announcements of the life of the church and what gets done here for children going to camp is very important. And the students who went to camp this week, they were blessed to be there. It's about their lives being transformed by Christ. And so we pray you'll bless that, Lord. And the good work that happened at Lake Placid this week will continue. It won't stop. And may those students, Lord, just continue to draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Have your way, I pray, in this place as we worship you. May you be first and center, Lord, and we will give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. You know, since before revival, the Lord has been speaking to my heart from Zacharias 10.1 about asking the Lord for the reign of His Spirit to fall down on us in these last days. 
And you know, in, in bringing the lost home, in, in reaching out to lost souls who need Jesus Christ, it's imperative that we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you will commit to pray daily for the reign of the Holy Spirit to come down upon you? Amen. That we might be effective in our ministry of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. Let's read this scripture together from Psalm 85, verses 6 through 13. Here we go. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what the Lord God will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to follow. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Can you say amen? amen? I have a new song I want to teach you this morning along that same thing. Uh, some of you may know it. You may have heard it on the radio. It's called Open Up the Heavens. And uh, I'm going to sing here uh, through a verse, pre-chorus, chorus, and the bridge one time with you just to familiarize you with the melody. We've waited for this day We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're saved. See you. 
Father's Day, but let's together wish the Father of Lights a happy Father's Day, our Heavenly Father. Story. 
a grandfather or a man that's in this church that says, I'll step up, I'll mentor another man, I'll disciple a man. I'll call that man weekly and ask him, how are you doing? And I'll ask him some hard questions and I'll pray with him and I'll share the word of God with him and I'll, I'll visit with him and look him in the face. And I'll make myself accountable. May we be accountable, Lord, to another. And I pray for that young man I talked to yesterday. And he said he had a man in his life every day. And that was part of his cure and his healing. And Jesus setting him free from drugs. But oh Lord, he's going to put himself in a vulnerable place. He said, it's been three months since I've talked to another man about my life. I pray, Father God, for him. I pray for the fatherless children. I pray for those this church ministers to, Lord. And they don't have a father in their home. I pray, Father God, you'll bless this ministry of discipling and ministry and of, of mentoring. That you'll help our men to be available and ready. Oh God, for your glory. Pray for your blessing on their homes. Those that are married, their spouse, those that have children and grandchildren, Lord. Some have great-grandchildren. They love you. And they love your church. And they're a man of God. Equip them and empower them. Use them for your glory. We're going to give you the thanks for that. We lift up the Nazarene General Assembly. As people are traveling, coming from all over the world to Indianapolis, we pray for an anointing of God upon those general superintendents. We ask that the preaching will be anointed and filled by the Spirit of God. And the message will go out to the people, the delegates and the lay people that come at large and the pastors that come to be encouraged. And the vision will be cast. And we'll hear great testimonies and great times of worship and refreshing and fellowship and being resourced, I pray, to come out of there and to spill back out so that we'll come out into our communities and our local church. May we bring it back to the local church, oh God. And may you pour out of us just what is needed. We pray for those among us that are sick and afflicted and hurting, that you'll lift them up and strengthen them. Oh God, the tragedies that we see in the news, our congressional leaders and the shooting and the wounds, we lift them to you. We pray, O oh Lord, for our president, our leaders, O oh God. We pray for our schools, the public schools, the home schools, the private schools. We pray, O oh Lord, for administrators and teachers. We pray for the businesses, O oh God, that they'll be good and right and blessed. We pray for every family. And the Holy Spirit descend upon every family. Courage the parents. Help the children to honor and respect their parents as to the Lord. Help the husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And the wives to honor and submit to their husbands as to the Lord. And may the blessing of God be on our homes. Oh Lord, anoint your church. Holy Spirit, pour out upon your church. The church of Jesus Christ. And we're a part of that church, Lord. Oh, Father, there's so much you want to do here. The problem's not with you, Lord. Your arm is not too short. The problem's with us. May we pray. May we seek God. May we cry out for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon this church. Make Naples First Church the Nazarene come alive because the Holy Spirit has visited us, oh God. The walls, this place should be filled, oh God. Because people are coming to Christ and we're inviting them and praying for them and witnessing for them. And when we worship, there ought to be vibrancy and excitement and joy going through the camp, oh God. May you visit us, Holy Spirit, in every church throughout the land, oh God. Revive your church, oh Lord, we pray. Revive your church, oh Lord, we pray. Oh God, we bless you. We thank you for all that you've done all that you continue to do. We ask it all in the strong, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we all said together, amen and amen. You may return to your seats. Amen. Pastor Jose, come with some announcements. And Kate, you got Zane in here?
All right, we want to congratulate Kate and Jesse, and they've got their baby Zane for the first time. Let's hold Zane up and see him. All right. Beautiful. Awesome. Let's see. I can vouch. I got to hold him the day after he was born, so I can vouch. He's a, he's a handsome guy. I guess you got candy. Didn't everybody get some candy when you came in? There we go. All right, look at that. Give him a hand. Beautiful. Zane Durden. Praise the Lord. Thank you guys for bringing him this morning. What a miracle. All right, Pastor Jose. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask for our ushers to come up. Our munchkin is here somewhere. Um, She's eating, so she's like her daddy, she likes to eat. <laughs> Let's uh, bow our heads as we take the morning tithes and offerings. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these people that are here. Lord, I ask that you continue to bless us, Lord. I ask that you continue to bless those that are listening to you and taking a step out of the faith. We are doing what you're asking to do. And giving the tithe and giving above that to other missions in this church, Lord, with the offering. So we thank you for that, Lord, and we thank you for those blessings. Lord, I thank you for this church family, Lord, and the leadership that is taking it seriously, good Lord. That we are asking for your wisdom to do the things that you're asking us to do with the money that you're giving us for your kingdom. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Jose, these kids here from camp. That's great. We love seeing this. 
This is, this is the church. This is great, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. When God builds a church, when God builds a church, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, let's stand in honor of God's word. Shall we stand? When God builds a church, he's got five powerful ingredients that he will use. We'll go over those this morning. The word of the Lord. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. When God builds a church, let's pray. Father God, build your church. The Bible says you will build your church. You'll build on the confession of those who acknowledge you as Savior and Lord. And the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. Father, make Naples first. Make the families that are within hearing this morning, the men, the students, build us, O oh Lord, so that heaven roars with excitement and and hell trembles because the gates of hell are going to come crashing down. Yes. When God builds a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Look at the word of the Lord. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of, say the word with me, peace. Peace. People are looking and longing for peace today. And the Greek word there is a word that indicates rest. It is a word that indicates prosperity and peace. It, it is often used along with the Hebrew, Hebrew word shalom. And the Bible tells us as God is building a church, He allows them to have this time of peace, of prosperity, of shalom. Every family wants that. Amen. You want that behind the doors of your home, don't you? Yes. Peace. The peace of God. The Jews at this time in history were under terrible persecution. Now the Jews have been under persecution. You know that. Since they were put on this earth to, to do what God wanted them to do. They've been under persecution. Much they've, they've brought some on themselves and, and nations have persecuted them and you see that in the news today, don't we? But the Jews being under persecution, they were the ones that were persecuting the Christians. The Jews were here in Scripture and here in history. And so what happened was there was a, a Roman influx that was coming against the Jews. They, they wanted to set up, one of, the, one of the leaders wanted to set up some idols right, right in the middle of where they were at and just wanted to erect statues and wanted to kind of desecrate their God. And so the Jews began to get preoccupied and fighting this Roman thing and this persecution that they were facing. And in the midst of that, the Christians got a break. Now you know Christians are under assault in our culture today. You, you're aware of that, right? Some of our universities, the studies and research that I've done, if you're a student at the university and you're a Buddhist, you're fine. If you're a Muslim, you're fine. If you're a Hindu, you're fine. If you're an atheist, you're probably going to just do real well. If you're a Catholic, you're probably fairly safe. But if you're an evangelical Christian, Watch out. And I tell the students, when you go off to college and you know from school, there's a lot of persecution. And it is there. And so Christians are being persecuted today. But here, as God's building His church, He lets them go through a time of peace. Now let's ask, what is peace? I think one way we can describe peace is an absence of worry. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. You know and I know that if you are caught up in worry, there's no peace. Right? If you are caught up in worry, 
worrying about this and this and this. And God tells us not to worry. So I think one aspect of peace is an absence of work. The second aspect of peace that I've put here in my notes is a wellness of your soul. If your soul is good, if it's been taken over by God, then whatever comes at you, you can say, it is well with my soul. Amen? Amen. And a wellness of soul. And see, we, there are people that are soul sick. You can be the finest physical specimen, as you see I am. Just imagine, just imagine that waistline, wouldn't you? I know it's going to take a lot of imagination. What do you expect? You guys give us candy in every class, all that good stuff? You can be the finest physical specimen. You can just have the best of blood pressure. Uh, each time I go to my doctor and they do the blood pressure, it's about 122 over 82 right in there. And they go, man, super, you're right on. And, and one time I said to a doctor, I said, see, I, I've got excellent blood pressure. He looked at me and he said, no, that's just the national standard. That's not necessarily the best of blood pressure. <laughs> Think of that. We can be the finest physical specimen. Heart can be in great shape. The muscular, the nervous system run tests on our blood and they can say, wow, amazing. Everything comes back great, but our soul can be diseased. Our soul can have a canker upon it. And sin corrupts our soul. Sin destroys and corrodes our soul. And the way that we can have that taken care of is only through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way that canker of the soul can be dealt with is through Jesus Christ. And I say to the congregation this morning, the peace of God comes through a right relationship with God. And you can have that today. Today. The peace of God. When God builds a man, when he builds a home, when he builds a father, when he builds a church, he offers peace. Peace. The third thing about peace, you will be in the battle, but you know God's got your back. Isn't that reassuring? Peace doesn't mean there's no battle. Peace doesn't mean, see, the war never ends. And I say to the men this morning, to the fathers, to you building a home, the ladies that are here, the students that are here, all of life will continue to have the sweat and the dirt and the tears and the bills and the creditors and the stress. If you know what that stuff's about, raise your hand, let me see. You see, pretty much all of us have been through adversity. We still go through it. If it's not that, it's our health. If it's not that, it's a relationship. It's a family member. I know some people that I kind of watch on and keep an eye on them and they're going through terrible adversity right now with a family member. A wound. A wound that is deep. Almost the worst you could imagine. And this is life. We're always going to be in the battle. That's why we always keep the full armor of God on. You see, when a time of peace comes, doesn't mean you take down the armor of God. You're always in the battle. You're always in the war. And you put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. Amen? The sword and the spirit, the word of God, praying in all occasions, feet that are fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Peace. So when God builds a church, it says here in Scripture, that church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoy a time of peace. When God builds a church, He offers peace. Doesn't mean there won't be a battle. There will be a battle. As a matter of fact, if there's not a battle, you are not in what you should be. If the church is not under attack, 
and everything seems to be happy and fun and there is no there are no issues, that means we're probably not where we're supposed to be. Amen? Amen. Secondly, when God builds a church, when He builds a family, when He builds your home, you young guys that are here, it'll happen. Pastor Jose and I'll be here. You'll come down the wedding aisle. You, well, you'll be down here already. I'm sorry. She'll come down the wedding aisle. And I tell you, when that happens, it's amazing. It's amazing. And when God builds your life now and builds your life later, you learn these lessons now, it will be a great blessing to you as you build that home. Amen? When God builds a home, when God builds a young man, when God builds a father, when he builds a church. Secondly, we see, it was strengthened. So he offers peace and strength. Now, that kind of strength, I'm tempted to covet. Yeah, I, I, I would like that. But outward strength is not true strength. Outward strength is not true strength. And the word that is used here, the word for strengthened, is the word edify. And you know, one of the words that we get from that is the word edifice. When you build an edifice. So fathers that are here, young men that are here, when you build your home, when you build your life, when God's building the church, okay, you start by marking out the ground. Where's the building going to be? So the ground is marked out. And there's a blueprint. And there's a foundation that is laid. Now I remind you, build your foundation on Jesus Christ and you will never regret it. Build your foundation on the things of the world and worldly success. And when you're old, the Bible says you will have given your life to the one who is cruel. And you will be bitter. And there'll be gnashing of teeth. Build your foundation on Jesus Christ and you will never regret it. Build your home on Christ. Build the church on Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He'll build his church on the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. So you lay the foundation. And then up come the walls. And then the rafters. And then the roof. And then the interior. And you got a home. Now listen, when God made Adam and Eve, and what an amazing class we had today. We love that man class. There were a dozen of us in there. Men, 930, we'd love to have you. Men, 930, we'd love to have you in there. We got a real good teacher, amen, men? And we appreciate Gary leading that class. We're, we're doing the topic of wild of heart. And we talked about the building of a home and a family. When God made Adam and Eve, his intention was that he was building, he was making a temple where he could dwell. He wanted to live inside of Adam and Eve. And when sin entered, that heavenly building collapsed. Paradise lost. Christ came to redeem humanity so that God can live in us. We are a temple built by God for Him to live in us. Say this with me. And I'm going to say it and repeat it. I was built to be a temple for God. Say that with me. I was built to be a temple for God. I was built to be a temple for God. And Christ's work in our body, in our soul, in our spirit, in our desire and passions and will. He purifies us. He refines us. And the power of the Holy Spirit comes on us and brings order and harmony. And we are restored and we can say, I am God's house. Amen. Say that with me. I am God's house. When God builds a church, when God builds a home, He uses peace and His strength Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. This, this scripture is going to get you excited. 1 Peter 2 verse 4. 1 Peter 2 4. 
1 Peter 2, 4, listen to what it says. As you come to Him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You see, there's a group of people out there that keep saying, once you come to Christ, you're a sinner. The Bible doesn't say once you come to Christ, you're still a sinner. The Bible calls us a holy priesthood. Let's not dumb down what Jesus did on the cross. Can I get an amen? Amen. God built us to be a holy priesthood. Look what it says. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Skip down to verse 9. I would like to have read all of that. But you're a chosen people. Would you say that with me? Chosen people. I'm going to say these phrases and I want you to repeat them after me. You ready? Chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession. Declaring the praises of the wonderful light. You are the people of God. Say people of God. People of God. Amen. See, we are a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. And the strength is not in the physical stature. Samuel had to learn that lesson. He was going to anoint the next king. We find this in Scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 16. You students that are here, you young people, listen to this verse. 1 Samuel 16, 7. I'm going to read that in a minute. And Samuel was going to anoint the next king. And he went to the house of Jesse. And the Bible says that he had his sons come out. He's got the horn of oil. He's going to lay hands on the next king. And the Spirit of God is going to come on the next king. The Spirit of God. So he's all ready. And he calls out the sons of Jesse. And the Bible tells us, here comes Eliab. He looked just like me, Eliab. Looked just like that. Looked just like me. And he's strong. And the Bible says that, that when Samuel saw him, he said, Surely the Lord's anointed. There he is. That's the king of Israel. He's big and strong and powerful. Now we're talking about true strength from the Lord. And the Bible says, I, I think, I think, reading between the lines, God's grieved a little bit with Samuel because Samuel's looking through worldly eyes. Listen, folks. Don't look at life through worldly eyes. What is your worldview? Is your worldview the same as the world? Or is your worldview looking through the eyes of the Lord? Yeah. Amen? Yes. You see, the world defines success through a different definition of strength. Strength comes through the size of your your muscles or the size of your portfolio or how far you can do this and how long and how big and how strong. And that seems to be strength. That's not how God measures success. As a matter of fact, God doesn't even call us to be successful. God calls us to be faithful. I repeat, God didn't call you to be successful. He called you to be faithful. Be faithful to Him. Be faithful to Him. Be faithful. And so these, these men come and God tells it. God tells Samuel. He says, Samuel, you're looking at it. I'm paraphrasing. You're looking at it through the wrong eyes. And this is what he said in 1 Samuel 16 and 7. God does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. Do you see where the strength's at? Are you hearing that, men? Are you hearing that as you build a home and a family and you minister to your grandkids and you decide, I will mentor another man? I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll mentor another man. I'll do it. See, I want to see that man's heart be strong. Don't you? I want to see that man's heart be strong. And so this whole idea of strength. And so he had a lion pass. He said, that's not the one. Abinadab passed. That's not the one. Shema passed. That's not the one. And then all seven sons came by. And Samuel, this great priest and prophet, he said to Jesse, Jesse, is that all your sons? 
You know what Jesse said? Jesse said, well, there, there's one left. He's the youngest. And he's out tending the sheep. Now God's speaking through Samuel. And he says, bring him in. And the Bible says, don't miss this. Don't miss this when it talks about strength. The Bible says that when Samuel saw him, the Lord said, this is the one. And he took the horn of oil. And he poured the horn of oil upon David. And the Bible says the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. Yeah. What man here wants the Spirit of God to come powerfully upon you? Let me see your hands, man. Yes, God. The what lady here wants the men to have the Spirit of God? Let me see. This is Father's Day. That's why I'm mostly addressing the men. But you know we want the Spirit of God on the women. Amen. If God can't get a faithful man, He'll find a faithful woman. And we believe in the calling and the gifts and the graces of women to help build the house of God. Amen? Amen. So the Bible says he poured the horn of oil on David and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Strength is the measure that you live out the presence and character of God. The Spirit of God in you is what makes you a strong man. A strong man. Strong men don't sell out. Strong men see life as an assault on the glory of God and they decide to fight for His honor. Strong men don't live in shame and fear. Satan wants you to be in shame and fear. You see, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, remember what happened? They were afraid of God and they hid. God doesn't want men living in shame and fear. That's why Satan attacks men. Men, are you ready? Tune in with me here. That's why Satan attacks men in the area that he attacks men because he wants men to live in shame and fear instead of confidence, courage, and vision with their eyes on Christ. And I know, I know there's a man problem in our culture. Somebody asked me this week, why is, why is Islam growing so much in our nation? And I had a few reasons, but one thing I know from research, many African-American men have been drawn to Islam because they didn't have a father in their life to give them order, to say, do that, do that. And so now they have this religion out here where they're kind of told, if you do this and this and this and this five times a day and do this and observe this holiday and do all of these things, then you may gain the, five, the favor of Allah. So that, that, that's, a, that's a father problem, isn't it? That's a father problem. And we've got that in our culture today. Strength. Micah 6.8. You guys know it. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, God. And I want to say to the men that are here, the fathers that are here, grandfathers, there's a time for you to remain gentle as a dove. There's also a time that you run to the battle and you turn over the tables of those who are doing evil and injustice. And we need such men today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Strength. Strength. A strong church is a church that has strong men, strong women, Strong teenagers. See, Satan works on us and he uses three tactics. One, I'm not here. This is just you. I'm not here. This is just you. The second tactic, he wants to intimidate you. He wants to mess with you. So when you follow the Lord, this happens and this happens. And then he sets this up and sets this up. And these things go on. So he's intimidating you. The third method that he uses, and this is probably the most dangerous it happens through seduction. He wants to cut a deal with you. If you only do this, then this will happen. 
If you only let up a little bit here, and this will happen. A strong man makes for a strong church. A strong man prays. I said a strong man prays. Amen? Amen. Amen. And this is more than that little two-minute prayer. A strong man gets on his knees and prays. A strong man grabs the hand of his wife and says, let's pray. Amen. A strong man cries out to God. A strong man weeps for the world that we live in. A strong man is willing to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was out of place. I shouldn't have been so manipulative. And I shouldn't have been so pushy. And I'm sorry. A strong man protects. Now listen, I'll stop with this. I've got more I want to share. When God goes to church, and we'll do it another time. I'll tie it into the next messages that I'm preparing. They tell us that many men in our culture, they protect their homes. They tell us that millions of Americans are armed. There's probably people here in the sanctuary today, they're, they're carrying a weapon of self-defense to protect them and to protect others around them and their freedoms. And men, they may have a gun at home and they may think I'm a strong man. If somebody breaks in here, I'll protect my home. And I'll, I'll say this. I will protect my home. But in our culture, all of those men, I'll protect my home, I'll protect my possessions, I'll watch out for my wife and children and family and stuff, and you break into that, you've had it, I'm going to hit you. Okay, those men, many of them in our culture, you see, they think they're strong, but they've allowed Satan to come in through other evil influences. I don't have time to go here today, but folks, there's a scourge on our land that is of epidemic proportions of men that are letting porn invade their home. Alcohol invade their home. Drugs invade their home. Bitterness, anger, isolation, and those home invaders are coming into the man who thinks he is strong and he will protect his home. And it's ripping the life out of his family and his influence and his legacy. When God builds a church, he wants a true, strong man filled with the Spirit of God. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. When God builds a church, peace. Peace. I'm not going to worry because God's got my back. There's still a battle. There's a war. Peace. When God builds a church, He brings strength. And that strength is the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. inside of us. Amen? Amen? All heads bow. All heads bow. I wanted to tell you about the fear of the Lord. And the encouragement of the Lord. I'll save that for another Sunday. And the increase that comes from the Lord when He built a church. Some of you, you may not know the peace of God. You might be a pretty good physical specimen, but your soul has got a canker sore on it. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in your soul, you know there's a sickness. In your soul, you know that you've sinned against the Lord. All He asks us to do is believe on Him as our Savior, confess our sins, repent, and turn from them, and follow Him. Is there any man, woman, any teenager that knows the soul is sick? There's no peace with God. If you were to die right now, you don't really know where you'd go. There's no peace with God through Jesus Christ. You, you may love the ways of the Lord, but you're really not walking with the Lord. And you desire the peace of God. Or I'm going to ask if there's a man here that he knows that he's pretended he was strong. But there's some weak areas. 
And the Holy Spirit needs to come in and fortify him and make him strong in the Lord and anoint him and fill him with God's Spirit. Man or woman. If those are where you're at, would you lift your hand to the Lord? All heads bowed. Lift your hand to the Lord. He sees that hand. Yes. Hands up all over our sanctuary. You can put your hands down. Let's pray. When God builds a church, when God builds a family, when God builds a man, when He builds a home, when He builds a precious woman, Teenager, when God does this, He offers peace. The Bible says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition present your request to God. And the, with thanksgiving and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When the storm comes, when the battle rages, you remind us, where's Jesus? They looked around and they found him sleeping on the boat. Christ is on board. He's got my back. And I've got the peace of the Lord in the middle of the battle. Oh Lord, there's many of us admitting weakness. We need the Holy Spirit to anoint us. We admit, Lord, that when you're building a church, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your church. The people that are here need the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. And we're here before you submissive. We're here before you humble. Break open the horn of oil and pour it upon our head. And may the Holy Spirit come all over us. And touch our eyes and our hearing. And our mind. And our heart. And our will. And our passions and desires. When God builds a house, we become a house where He can live. I'm God's house. And may His glory shine through us. Those that have raised their hand, I pray, Lord, for Your special touch upon them this morning. I pray for faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to bring the peace of God through Jesus. And I pray for the strength of the Lord to come upon them. When God builds a church. We leave this place, Lord, now. And we leave in your blessing. You've given us what we need. We can go out and do the assignment that you've given to us. And we can do it for the glory of God. And it's in Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Happy Father's Day. God bless you. You are dismissed.